Leeds United have played against Huddersfield Town and unfortunately dropped points against the Terriers after a pretty disappointing one all win. In this video, I'm going to go through the dogged defending that ultimately slowed down the Whites. See? Dogged. It's, ah! The fact that Leeds United weren't really creative enough, and it's not the end of the world at all. But first, I would hugely appreciate if you can like the video, subscribe, and comment. That's always massively appreciated for a relatively small channel, and it helps us to continue to grow. Join this nice little community. Anyway, diving into the match, the first thing that was really notable from both of the sides was there was a hell of a lot of aggression, particularly out of the Huddersfield team, but Leeds started sort of responding in kind, and it didn't quite work out well. Huddersfield ultimately came out swinging and seemingly trying to injure some key players. You could tell that from some major examples, like deliberately elbowing Junior Furpo in the face when he's gone for a header, and stamping on Crescencio Somerville's calf. They should have been down to fewer than 10 men, which they went down to in, I think, the 45 plus 6th minute, the 6th minute of stoppage time in the first half, for a second yellow card. But it should have been a straight red to begin with, because that is violent conduct, and that counts as a red card. But I suppose not. It might be a thing that's reviewed. It probably won't be. We're just dealing with championship refs at this point, and ultimately it is a case of poor refereeing. There need to be some efforts to protect players in these cases because you will get sides like Leicester, Southampton, Ipswich that will try and play nice, beautiful, flowing football, attacking the other team. And in response, sides towards the bottom of the league will not attack the other team, but literally attack the other team. Get kicky, get attacking, and it's not good. It reduces fitness, it hurts people, and it causes bigger problems. But ultimately, that wasn't the reason we lost. So we need to talk about what went wrong. Sorry, had to cut there for a second. Uh, what I feel went wrong can be broken down into at the back of the pitch and at the front of the pitch. And first, I'm going to break down what went wrong at the back of the pitch, but it's more what people think went wrong compared to what actually went wrong. The issue at the back of the pitch was we conceded a goal from a set piece again. Now. We were second to both the shot and the rebound, which meant that we weren't able to pick up on the ball, get it clear, and that caused a problem. However, there are some people blaming Ilan Melier for it, and that's really harsh. So, ball comes in, fired in at Ilan Melier, who makes the first save. However, the ball sort of goes underneath him at the same time, so whilst he's like dropping his weight, he goes onto the ball, which pings out forwards. That is completely out of his control. If there is anything that you can do, as you are mid-fall, to stop falling on the thing that is inches underneath you, fair play to you. But most human beings cannot stop themselves falling on a ball in that situation, and he was unfortunate in that it pinged out directly forwards to the Huddersfield Town player. And I think it's very tough to assign blame to Ilan Melier there. He did what he needed to do, and he made plenty of great saves before that. One of them was just to his right-hand side, managed to get to it. One of them fired from a distance. I can't remember who took the shot. It might have been Rodoni or someone like that. But I think Ilan Melier genuinely had a good game today. There wasn't too much that you could blame him for. He didn't let that many chances come his way. And what did come his way, he dealt with. Other than getting really unfortunate with the goal, which arguably potentially defenders could have got on there beforehand. But again, it's hard to blame people. Set pieces are what they are because that's what they are. That was the stupidest sentence I've ever said. They're sort of unpredictable. And when you concede a goal from a set piece as a one-off, there's not really some big fundamental differences that you need to make there. However, at the top of the pitch, I think we had a little bit more of an issue in this game. And I'm going to break down attackers as a concept into two different groups. Your direct and direct attackers that like running at a defender and your more patient attackers. So in essence, you've got your patient attackers that like to dribble, like Somerville, and your more direct attackers like Dan James, who will just run at a player. Somerville's going to try and trick him. James is just going to try and outrun them. And this is where I think we had the big issue when it came to going forwards in this game. Defenders in a low block have a fairly nice time against a patient attacker because the patient attacker has the ball, will try and take on their man, and even if they beat one player, it's a low block. There's a second player waiting behind them. That's why I think we had a lot of issues today. Crescencio Somerville kept looking for spaces to try and force an attack to happen, when in reality, any time he tried to dribble past a player, there'd just be another one lined up. The one time that he managed to break this trend was when he cut inside, had that shot that hit the post, which was really unfortunate to not go in. But I think stylistically, he wasn't suited to consistently attacking in the same way that when James came on, he caused some immediate issues, because... Although they sat deep, when you've got Dan James running at you at that speed, you need to make a tackle. You can't just wait and stand off like you can with Somerville. And James 
doing that led to some space, which Connor Roberts was able to use firing Bamford scored the goal. And I don't think we use the right-hand side of the pitch often enough in this game. Pretty big issue, to be fair, especially when we've made two changes to players over on that side. It's like when the ball went over to Somerville, it got stuck. And I'm not personally blaming Somerville here either. It's the type of player that he is. And he's not been able to train as much as he's wanted because he's been carrying some knocks. It's just something we need to keep in mind going forwards that if the ball is getting stuck and stodgy with Somerville and we are desperately in need of a goal, maybe it could be an idea to make a change. Anthony coming on for Somerville in that case instead, I think would have been a little bit be better because Anthony's also going to stand really high up the pitch. So if you replace Furpo with Anthony, you've not got those overlapping runs from Furpo because Anthony's already there. I think we just caused ourselves a couple of problems there and we could have taken all three points today. Unfortunate not to, but ultimately, what does this all mean? And I'm taking a little bit of a wider view of it. What does this match mean for the promotion push? And at the end of the day, it's only two points dropped. Since the new year, we've had 10 matches. We've drawn one and we've won nine. The amount of people that are calling for Farker to leave or make significant changes to the squad need to get a sense of scale here. Because we're looking fine. Any team that gets promoted will drop points in this manner. There is no one that is going to win every single match against a bottom half team because that's obscene. You can't expect that. Bits of randomness happen. At the end of the day, we have closed in on Leicester City today. They've lost their third game in a row. The gap is down to five points. And I would argue that now it's not a discussion of two teams. Sorry, it's not a discussion of one team from Ipswich Leeds and Southampton go up it's two from four Leicester are back in that conversation again and that is fantastic that puts the pressure on to them and in addition to that all of the teams around us are going to drop some points Southampton still need to play Ipswich and Leicester so that could be Southampton drop six points it turns into a three horse race for two positions it could be Leicester drop three points to Southampton suddenly we're within two it could be Ipswich do the same thing suddenly we're ahead of Ipswich in the league again there is a hell of a lot that we can do here and there are teams that are going to drop points. But ultimately, I think this game taught us a big lesson of do not get complacent. Huddersfield, low in the league. But they were a potential like landmine. Because they're a lower in the division side, potentially going to cause problems, always going to play like this. And we need to work out a way to deal with it in the future. Because otherwise, if this happens again and again and again, we could have issues. But I think Daniel Farker is good enough to learn from it, create a plan for the next time and work in situations where teams want to get this agricultural against us. And ultimately, let's get it done, shall we? 11 games left, plenty of chances, and I hope it doesn't come down to Southampton on the last day, but if it does, I think we'll be completely fine. Ultimately, I want to know what you think, though. Let me know in the comments down below. Like the video if you enjoyed at any point, and subscribe. I will see you later. I don't know what to do for the like post thing word. Sandwich. Sod it. It's a good word, isn't it? And I'm very hungry. So I'm going to go get some food. See you later. <laughs>